Um, hi, so yes, I'm Peter Coyle, um, and with me today, uh, Raj Subramani. Uh, we both work at, in risk technology for HSBC Bank. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Raj, who will explain uh, to us and talk about our journey to using Apache Beam for one of our key risk platforms. However, before I hand over to Raj, um, I'd like to provide just a brief outline of the business problem that uh, we're using Beam to solve. So many of you will be familiar with the name HSBC. We are a large international bank operating across many different markets. Uh, the system we're going to talk about today uh, relates to the investment banking part of the business. So this business involves trading with many different customers. Um, they're typically large firms, other banks and governments. And through this trading, we build up portfolios with each of those customers. Um, this, this generates a challenge um, that the challenge of this is the value of those portfolios moves with the financial markets. We therefore need to understand and quantify and manage the risk in these portfolios. One of the most, one of the more difficult risks to quantify is credit risk. Um, and it's this credit risk system that um, we want to talk about today. So for those um, that don't have experience with financial services, um, kind of put simply, uh, credit risk is managing the risk when um, that one of the uh, customers or counterparties that we interact with is not able to kind of deliver on the contractual agreements that we've, uh, we've made with them. Um, so in order to quantify this, we need to understand the range of values that the portfolios we have could take throughout the lifetime of those, uh, of those deals. So this is kind of not always as simple as it sounds. So because the portfolios move with the financial markets um, and that there is no crystal ball, it's impossible to predict uh, the future um, accurately, we need to kind of look at the, the problem in a different way. So there is a lot of structure in financial markets um, and we can model that structure. So the system that we, we have uses these models um, and the technique called Monte Carlo analysis to come up with lots of plausible um, examples of how the future markets could evolve. So this leads us to having to generate billions of trade valuations, um, which is very computationally intensive, and also aggregate all of those results into meaningful statistics. So I'm now going to hand over to Raj Subramani, who's going to talk us through how we used um, Apache Beam um, to solve some of these technical challenges. Thank you, Peter. Hi, I'm Raj, and I'll uh, take you through the actual uh, crux of what we're here for, which is the, the Beam part of it. But before that, um, I will quickly talk about you know, the history of risk engines and, and how they have traditionally done stuff. So, so risk, I mean, risk is, um, is, a, pro, is a transformation process. As, as Peter has explained earlier, there is structure in the, mar in, in, the, in the way financial markets behave. That structure can be statistically modeled and that, that model can be captured into code. Uh, typically, C++ code is what people tend to traditionally write in this area. Um, and what you do uh, and, and the kind of DAG you see in front of you is you got trade and market data on one side and, and, the, and the risk or the statistical process or the model that Peter talked about is that little green box in the middle 
that transforms that trade and market data into some sort of a metric, whether it's a mark to market metric or a PL metric or a or a risk metric. And, and there are various different types of metrics involved. In in this particular case, we're talking about uh, exposure to the counterparty as the principal metric we are interested in. So what happens in traditional risk engines, um, which is widely used in investment banking, um, decades of uh, experience, you get a lot of people with knowledge of this, um, is, is what is traditionally known as a task-based risk engine. And as I told you in the earlier slide, you are essentially passing trades to the risk engine. The market data is either preloaded into the risk engine or the risk engine loads the market data that's most relevant to the trades dynamically. But nevertheless, the, the little brown boxes you see on your left-hand side are the, uh, if you like, the trades or groups of trades, if you want to uh, group them, sometimes it's efficient to do so. Uh, those are the tasks, you, and, and there could be hundreds of thousands of these tasks that you want to pass through. Um, so traditional risk engines have what is known as the task-based engines have a manager, a broker, and then the engines on the far right-hand side of your diagram. The, the engine is where you're loading your C++ code. Um, generally, these engines are managed through a Java-based process. The, the manager you know, looks up at the queued up tasks it needs to evaluate for the day. It queues them up in front of the broker. The broker feeds these tasks into the, um, into the engine. The engine does the calculation, uh, quickly discharges, discharges the results into um, either a database or a, or a cache of some sort. And, and, and the idea is that the quicker the engine discharges it, the quicker it can take the next task from the broker. So throughput is very, very important. And that is generally managed by, by engineering, you know, people who manage these grids uh, spend a lot of time making sure throughput is maximized. Um, so, so what happens with these engines is that you are, as I said, the engine is discharging the data onto some sort of a uh, cache or database or flat file even. Um, or very often it's a NAS with, the, with a flat file. Then you, you upload that, those pieces of data points into, into a database or an OLAP cube. Then you do a slice and dice. You, you produce your MapReduce results. You write them out. You load them back again into a reporting system, and then you produce a report. So, so that multi-step process is what traditionally people have been doing, but a lot of I/O in between these processes, um, which is fine when you have small amount of loads and and small amount of batches. But with the regulatory change that has happened in the last ten or twelve years, this the amount of data that is being expected uh, for uh, from a regulatory perspective. Is, is getting to be phenomenally large. So these kind of multi-stage IO-based processes are not scaling very well. So we started in HSBC, started to look at Beam um, as, a, as a risk engine process uh, in, in 2017 or thereabouts. Um, and, and it turned out to be, you know, this is when Google Dataflow was transiting just at that point to Apache Beam. Uh, and it turned out that it is quite a good engine uh, to to make an external call. Um, as I mean, this diagram is is something everyone who's attending this conference should be fairly familiar with. Beam is a, a distributed DAG engine. It supports MapReduce clearly. So you know, it has all the elements that that you would traditionally expect a task-based risk engine. Um, to, to have, to, to, you would expect to see that within Beam. Uh, so the work we did specifically in, in three or four years ago, which was to make a call from a do function to an external process. That is, uh, there's public blogs about this, um, you know, from well-known people in the, in the Beam uh, space. So you can look that up. Um, you know, there's examples in, in Git for you to download and run it. But the work we did was about calling an external analytics process from within a do function within Beam, uh, and how we exchange that data between that, that do function and this external process. Typically, the external process is C++, as I said earlier. 
but you know you have analytics being increasingly written in python as well and if your do function is in python then it's it's relatively easy um, but if your your analytics is c++ which is the most prevalent one you can exchange your data through protobufs um, you know between the do function and the analytics process the the blogs that uh, I spoke about earlier, you know, do explain in some detail why protobufs are a good idea, uh, partly because the IO, C out, C in parts of uh, C++ spew a lot of noisy data out. But, you know, I would, I would refer you to those blogs if, if you really want to understand why you should use protobufs for, for this exchange. Um, so, you know, that kind of that showed us, um, you know, there was some extra work done clearly um, in, in Google Dataflow to allow us to load and, and distribute these uh, C++ libraries. This has become part and parcel of uh, Apache Beam now. Um, and, you know, we run uh, Beam as a Dataflow process uh, with Dataflow as the runner in Google Cloud. We also run uh, Beam as with a Flink runner inside HSBC. And if we were to use another cloud provider, we would use Flink as the runner. Um, so for example, if you take AWS, uh, you know, Beam is available as a managed service in AWS with, with Flink as the principal runner. Um, so, but the rest of the slides I'm going to talk about is largely skewed towards Dataflow and, and Google because that they are our principal cloud providers. So the, um, some of the statistics you know, that we are looking at is um, we've, we've got uh, a whole bunch of regions we process data on. We have uh, just over 5 million trades we have to get through every day, largest population being in, in Europe. And you know, the, the uh, average trade count per batch is, is shown there. Uh, I'm going to go through these slides a little bit quickly because they may or may not be of interest to you, but since these slides will be circulated to you, you can always take your time to look at these uh, at a later point. The number of computation points, which is the central table there is probably the most interesting one. You can see uh, close to 466 billion evaluation points that we do for Europe on a daily basis. So we're close, getting close to three quarters of a trillion evaluation points on a daily basis. Uh, across our portfolios worldwide. Um, and this is where, you know, the, because we are talking about hundreds of thousands of trades, thousands and thousands of scenarios, many, many time points, and each one of those becomes an evaluation point. Uh, the advantage in this particular case, Peter mentioned Monte Carlo. In, in many of these cases, the Monte Carlo is an is a, a embarrassingly parallel process. So it, it suits the beam paradigm of, uh, you know, distributing the tasks within, within workers uh, and, and getting the scale out that you expect to see. So this is a typical weekly run uh, of our batches uh, on the left axis, uh, vertical axis is the scale of the CPUs we deploy uh, on a daily basis. Um, you know, the pattern is, um, a repeating pattern, an almost repeating pattern, where you know this is the daily graph of that. Of this is the weekly graph, and when I zoom in into one day of that week, this is how our daily distribution looks like. And uh, you know, you you would expect when we are processing European data, some of the peaks to happen there, which is uh, which comes out in the graph. The next big uh, trade population. If you look at, uh, at at the trade population, there is the next big one is Asia, 1.4 million. So again, when you, when those batches kick in, you see a, a peak in the CPU usage. So, you know, cloud becomes quite an attractive proposition. We are we are we are borrowing the CPUs as we need it, and then return it back as 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 the batch finishes and we are done with them. I mean, there's some additional uh, data and and graphs which I will not go through because you know. Uh, I want to leave some time for questions if people have any. Uh, and these are probably better for you to go through uh, in your own time. So what are some of the considerations when you're running Beam at this scale um, for a problem like this um, in, in cloud providers is that you have to first, and this is not true of 
just risk engines, but probably true of any loads that you run in Beam, is to try and work out, you know, what your um, best profile of machine types is. Um, so the orange line is the time it takes to run a particular job, wall clock time, if you like, which is the left-hand vertical axis. And the blue bars are the costs per run, um, which varies from one times uh, X number of dollars to six times X number of dollars, which is the right-hand vertical graph. And, and at the bottom is the machine types. In, in our particular case, we found a, a particular machine type to give us, which is sitting right here, um, it's into the uh, 16, uh, high M 16 machine type, turned out to be the best type for the profile of jobs we run. It gives us the uh, lowest cost for the quickest runtime. So that was our preferred option uh, to use uh, within within cloud providers. So so when you when you go into uh, these kind of very specific machine types, you obviously have to work with your cloud provider to make sure that the data centers you're deploying this, uh, you know, you have the capacity. They have the capacity to support you. Dataflow has the additional problem of having slots. Um, allocation as well, apart from the uh, CPU quota allocation. And, and then when you get into certain periods of uh, the year when, when there's a run on CPUs in the cloud, uh, you know, Cyber, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, that sort of events, uh, run up to Christmas when there's, there's a lot of online shopping. If you're in a particular region, you know, maybe Chinese New Year or something in Asia, again, you'll see, you know, there's a run on CPUs. Uh, what do you do? Because um, you can either book these CPUs in advance, and if you don't want it, that's going to cost you uh, something. It's not going to be for free. If you don't want to do that, you might you might need an alternative strategy. The alternative strategy we have adopted here is to automatically default the batches to more uh, common machine types, um, which which you know as you go from left to right is uh, the end ones uh, are the by far the most prevalent in Google Cloud. Uh, the, the consequence of that is if with end ones you're sitting there, so your costs are a bit higher, but you know, the show must go on, production must run. So, you know, you, you, we, we simply take that hit. So apart from Cyber Monday and Black Friday, which are known events, you can get stock outs anytime during the year uh, due, to, due to market volatility or whatever the cost may be. So you may want a strategy where you are able to, to switch machine types, which is what we have done. So um, to conclude, um, you know, we have found Beam being a natural um, uh, kind of process executor where you can execute an external C++ process and then take that resulting data coming back from the C++, you know, apply a MapReduce paradigm to your uh, processing uh, is a, a, a great risk engine alternative because it, it allows you to do the whole thing in, in a single pass. And then we, um, you know, so clearly it, it works quite well. Um, and the, the uh, move from uh, sort of uh, C++ to Python obviously makes Beam even more attractive because you can run native Python now within, within Beam. And we are also excited by the new developments coming in Beam, the portable runners and, and the ability to have mixed mode running where Java does the IO and, and Python can run the analytics. All that sort of stuff is, is going to increase throughput and efficiency. Um, so yeah, we're quite excited about this. And thank you for your time. This is what I'm concluding with. If you have any questions, please reach out. Oh, 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 oh,